Good evening and welcome to International House here at the University of Chicago and to this very special program. My name is Denise Jorgens and I'm the Director of International House. The mission of International House is to enable students and scholars from around the world to live and learn together in a diverse residential community that builds lifelong qualities of leadership, respect, and friendship. This mission is achieved by daily interaction among our residents through our unique facilities and residential life activities and through our public programs that are designed to foster diversity of thought and experience. This evening's program is one of over 200 public community outreach programs held each year at International House. Whether it's a world music or dance performance, a lecture, a conference, or a symposium, an international film festival, or a cultural celebration, International House Public Programming presents public programming that advances cross-cultural understanding and promotes opportunities for civic discourse on community, national, and world affairs. These programs would not be possible without the support and collaboration with organizations across the campus and from around the, the uh, Chicago area, including tonight the Office of Civic Engagement, the Diversity Leadership Council, the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, the Seminary Co-op Bookstores, Agate Publishing, and of course, the Chicago Tribune. On behalf of the International House community, I would like to thank all of you for coming this evening, and I look forward to seeing you at many of our future events. And now I'd like to introduce Sonia Malunda, Senior Associate Vice President for Community Engagement to begin our program. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Denise, and good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. That's much better. I'd like to also welcome uh, all of you to the University of Chicago and to the university's U Chicago Engagement Series. When the, the Office of Civic Engagement was first approached about the opportunity to co-sponsor tonight's discussion, we knew it would fit perfectly under what we call U Chicago Engages. This is an event series that brings together university faculty, staff, students, and community together to participate in a dialogue on important urban and social issues. We are so delighted that many of you are here this evening. As Denise mentioned, this event would not have been possible without collaboration, partnership, and engagement. And I would also like to echo and thank all of our sponsors for tonight's event. Immediately following the discussion, we hope you will join us for a community reception with light refreshments and hopefully more, hopefully more discussion with your colleagues, neighbors, and friends. Now, it is a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce tonight's featured speakers. Our colleague at the University of Chicago, Michael Dawson, is the John D. MacArthur Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science here at the University of Chicago. He is a noted researcher and author whose work includes the development of quantitative models of African American politi political behavior, identity and public opinion, the political effects of urban poverty, and African American political ideology. In recent years, he has combined his quantitative work with work in political theory. His first two books, Behind the Mule, Race and Class in African American Politics, and Black Visions, The Roots of Contemporary African American Political Ideologies, won multiple awards, including the latter winning the prestigious Ralph Bunch Award 
from the American Political Science Association. Mr. Dawson has also served in a number of leadership roles here at the university as chair of the political science department and he has also taught at the University of Michigan and at Harvard. He is the founding and current director of the university center for the study of race, politics, and culture. Professor Dawson will lead what promises to be, and I promise you, it will be an engaging discussion with our featured guest, Chicago Tribune columnist and Pulitzer Prize winner Clarence Page. Mr. Page first joined the Chicago Tribune in 1969 and became a columnist 30 years ago in 1984. In 1989, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for commentary. His column was first syndicated nationally in 1987, and today his writing is featured in more than 150 publications. You may have also seen him on MSNBC's The Chris Matthews Show and NPR's Weekend Edition. Mr. Page is held in equally high esteem for his work in both print and broadcast media not only for his wealth of knowledge and insight, but also for his incisive criticisms regarding society's most pressing political and social issues. He is also a member of the Chicago Tribune editorial board. So please join me and give Professor Dawson and Mr. Page a very warm welcome as they make the shocks people to hear that Pat Buchanan and I are friends, but uh, he's even closer to Eleanor Clift and to, uh, and to um, um, uh, my uh, a friend from uh, uh, Rachel Maddow uh, as well, and uh, we get the same reactions from their friends. You like Pat Buchanan? <laughs> hey, you know, Pat Buchanan's a great guy if you don't talk politics. <laughs> yeah. Just stay away from that, you know. You know. But he, uh, but he really does see the world a different way than I do. And I mean, he was right there uh, inside the uh, uh, the uh, Nixon administration uh, while uh, they were busy drafting me. But that's another story. Uh, but um, it's like he's just written a book, in fact, which is sort of an apologia for Richard Nixon. I said, "You're a brave man, Pat." And he, uh, I, I asked him a couple of weeks ago, back when I, when I picked him up on a group, you know, uh, uh, how's the book going? And he said, "Well." Not as, not as great as my other books. Uh, I guess these aren't the times for an apology for Nixon uh, or, or, or praise for Nixon. But his 
other books, by the way, are uh, essentially um, uh, raising the alarm bells because they, quote unquote, are taking over our culture and our country and our hemisphere, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I go, go to great pains to try to ease uh, whatever anxiety is out there about this. But I, I don't think most Americans share uh, those views. And I, I think um, we're kind of schizophrenic uh, in, in many ways. Uh, we Americans uh, always have been. I mean, going back to the days of, 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 uh, of Je Thomas Jefferson, wrote those wonderful words of uh, uh, equality and opportunity and expressing these terms, terms of the Enlightenment uh, uh, while having his, his ink brought to him by his slaves. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, he and the rest of the founding fathers. Uh, and uh, uh, now that, thanks to modern DNA, we know just uh, DNA research, we know uh, just how much they fathered that we hadn't we weren't aware of before. <laughs> but um, this is, uh, but we've always been uh, that way, a, a hypocritical country uh, in a um, an optimistic way um, that um, we uh, are, know we aren't perfect, but we want to be more perfect. <laughs> and so we get this. Uh, a uh, little uh, uh, tautology there uh, to uh, build a more perfect union. Huh? And uh, because we always have that, uh, we're, we've always got that basic striving. And Jefferson was very careful to put in the pursuit of justice, or the, the, the pursuit of happiness, because uh, originally it was life, liberty, and property. But pursuit of happiness. That's what, so that's what we Americans do. And I, I think that uh, I, I see, you know, Chicago is known as a very, very racist city, most segregated in the country, and blah, blah, blah. You, you, you hear all this, but I think about it, coming from, from Middletown, Ohio, um, the John Boehner's district, for those of you who are curious, just north of Cincinnati, that's where Boehner and I, as I was saying earlier, we, we grew up in the same uh, district, but in different worlds. Uh, <laughs> both, you know, working class, democratic families, and, and both of us, you know, I was happy to get my first paycheck when he got his, he saw him, which is paying taxes, and became a Republican. Uh, true, true story, as, as he puts it. Uh, but um, the, uh, well, I came to Chicago and I say uh, this, as I was telling the students earlier, uh, this city that celebrates the hyphen. I, I, I love this, you know, uh, we, all, we all say, well, I'm not Italian-American or Irish-American, I'm just American, right? You know? But in Chicago, one day a year you get to celebrate your hyphen. You know, from Columbus Day or St. Patrick's Day in March to Columbus Day in October, everybody gets their own parade, their own their own day, their, their festival, Pulaski Day, St. Stanislaus Day, uh, Bud Billiken Day, uh, the uh, Puerto Rican uh, Parade Day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We all have have one day to celebrate that, and and th this to me is America. We are not a melting pot; we're a mulligan stew, uh, as, as I prefer uh, to call it. Uh, we, we all contribute some flavor to the pot. We all take some flavor out. But over time, each generation gets better. Each, each generation becomes more perfect. Uh, and um, just ask my son, he'll tell you. <laughs> this, his generation is much more perfect than my generation. <laughs> well, I think our generation was more perfect than our parents' generation, but it didn't even stop with us. No, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> we like to think so, don't we? <laughs> so what I have problems with is I agree with 99% of what you just said. But then I read your other columns where you're lamenting the sore core of the base of the Republican Party and the mm -hmm. amount of polarization that you're complaining about at dinner, yeah. found in, in your new hometown, uh, in D.C. Yeah. What's the relationship on one hand that there's actually, you know, people like me measure the type of progress we've made over the years on one hand, but we have all the resentment and all the bitterness and all the political polarization. How do those things fit together? Yeah, well, one reason why I, I, I put this book together uh, besides the fact that I woke up one day earlier this year, found that I realized I've been writing a column for 30 years, and decided to look and see, you know, what have I learned? You know, has my voice changed, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And also the fact that uh, uh, Charles Krauthammer did a book last year, there's 30 years of columns, and if Charles Krauthammer can do it, so can I. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, but but the, the the third reason though was I, I wanted to really uh, see. Uh, what I had learned over those years and what might I want to do another real book, as I put it, about a single subtopic book. And I'm, I'm more committed to a topic that's been in the back of my head for a long time, which is uh, um, uh, how the party of Lincoln lost people of color. Mm -hmm. That's one of your uh, chapters. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I, um, 
I'm part of the generation, I, I was born in the Eisenhower era, and I came of age in uh, the era of, of JFK, LBJ, and Goldwater, and George Wallace, and uh, a white backlash, etc. When the Tea Party rose up, I felt like they uh, should go all over again. Uh, and uh, it still intrigues me, though, fascinates me, that when Eisenhower in 1956 got somewhere in the high 30s uh, uh, in, in a percentile of, percentage of the black vote. Um, you see different estimates, but somewhere around 35% or more, more of the black vote for a lot of different reasons. Um, my favorite reason was, was Little Rock High School, uh, uh, and, uh, watching Central High School desegregated by the, uh, uh, by the uh, one of the airborne divisions um, was uh, really was my political moment. I think I was 11, 10 or 11 when that happened. And I was, um, I turned to my parents and said, you know, one day I'm watching the Arkansas National Guard keep the black kids out of the high school. Next day, the, uh, uh, I think it was the 82nd Airborne. It was 82nd. Escorted the kids into the high school. And I turned to my parents and said, what happened? And my dad said, President Eisenhower. Now, I thought President Eisenhower was the job title. <laughs> you know? And I, I, I remember asking, well, well, when this President Eisenhower is gone, who'll be the next President Eisenhower? Yeah. Uh, because that's just how powerful that presence was to me, uh, that you had that ability to do that overnight. Because to me, segregation, Jim Crow segregation was done. We go down south to visit our family down in what we call the old country, and you all call it Alabama. Uh, we would, um, I, I remember the uh, first time I saw the white colored signs, I was about five or six, uh, old enough to read them. And uh, I'd, uh, I'd go off, off to get a drink of water in this um, a five and ten cent store. Which is something I'll explain to you, young people, but a nickel and a dime are later. Uh, but um, the, uh, we got off there, and, and, and uh, my my mother says, "Where, where is he? Uh, you know, go find him." To, to my dad, and he, he finds me in front of these two water fountains, one marked white, one marked colored, and I'm at the one marked colored, turning the water on and off, very disappointed that's coming out clear, like. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was the day I first heard the word segregation, you know? and I mean, so there's always been this absurdity to these kind of politics, but yet it's so absurd, but it still lasted a century after the Civil War, you know. And who were the big proponents, who, who was the big progressive force in the late 1800s? The Republican Party, that coalition of Lincoln, uh, which, was, which my newspaper helped to found, Joseph Medill. And uh, who, we got a painting in, in Tribune Tower of Joe Medill and Abe Lincoln uh, with long legs there sitting there at Medill's desk while Medill's trying to talk him into running because uh, you know, Lincoln was a Whig and, and he wasn't sure about, about whether this new Republican Party was going to go anywhere. Uh, and um, it, uh, after doing that favor for black folks, uh, it took the Tribune 120 years to hire their first black reporter. Uh, but uh, why, why hurry these things, you know? I mean, you have to be careful. Yeah, yeah you, you know, you don't want to be too radical, except uh, Medill was a radical at the time. He was a radical Republican, that's what they, uh, they called themselves and all this. Stuff. And uh, what, this is a very American thing, you know. Um, you have this really powerful progressive movement uh, that um, is in and out of power, Teddy Roosevelt, numerous other names that, that uh, so much of what we know today as progressive politics began with Republicans. Uh, and Democrats were the racist party at the time. They were the apologists for segregation and uh, defenders of the party of John C. Calhoun and, and, and the rest. Uh, and, uh, and yet, you know, there were, there were significant turning points, particularly around um, uh, FDR, uh, and even more so at the time of Cold Water and all. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of debate and a lot of revisionism that goes on, as there always has been. Uh, even in the days of Calhoun, when they, there were arguments made with the Bible that uh, segregation is God's way, just like keeping those those homosexuals apart and stuff like that. You know, this is all these same arguments we keep seeing them pop up again. It's fascinating to me uh, what, what I call a historical study without grudges. Just looking at what does it, what do these shifts say about us Americans? Because uh, I, um, like I said, I, um, I have a fondness in my heart for Republicans, and I and um, I uh, was a, uh, I call myself a Republican uh, in high school, uh, and, and I love Barry Goldwater. I mean, he favored uh, uh, ending the draft, legalizing marijuana, legalizing prostitution. What is there in that package for a 16-year-old boy not to love? <laughs> you know, that's like, Barry, you're my man. 
And then Barry voted against the Civil Rights Act of 64 in my junior year. I said, Barry, you're not my man anymore. <laughs> and that, a lot of black folks said that. <laughs> and uh, you know, what, what, why does this happen? And, and, you know, I, I, I was talking with, with Buchanan about this. And it was just going right, right over, over his head, uh, this whole notion. Because to him, the Republicans have never changed. They've always been the same. They've stayed consistent. Uh, and I, I talked with uh, Rand Paul about this, too. And this, this is why he embarrassed himself at Howard University. Because he was giving the Republican, uh, or excuse me, the conservative, not Republican, but the conservative view, the, the modern conservative uh, view of history. And a lot of folks still carry this around in their heads and they wonder why they're not getting votes from people of color. So it's, um, but I think it says something about the country uh, that we are taking in this direction because now we've become the party, uh, we've become the country where uh, one party wins in the off years and one wins in the presidential years. And the big reason is because of that uh, color gap, yeah, but not only because of that color gap. Yeah. Well, one of the other gaps you talk about is the gender gap. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of your chapters is how did the GOP, GOP lose people of color? Um, and spectacularly, so you point out, if they had done even half as well, um, I guess they did do about half as well under Romney as they did under Bush, and winning the Latino vote, we would have a President Romney at this point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if Romney had done as well as Bush did yeah. in, 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 in 04. Yeah. And there are reasons why Bush did so well in 04. One, one of them was uh, uh, going to black, black churches and saying, uh, gay marriage is coming. you got to stop it. Uh, in, in Ohio and Pennsylvania and Florida in particular, made a big difference. But I think at the same time, Barack Obama coming out in favor of same-sex marriage and not being pilloried for it in the black community, except in some reaches, of, uh, and I saw some black ministers who took out, out after Obama and had to pull back because Obama was more popular than they were. So I think that was a big, another underappreciated contribution Barack Obama has made to uh, uh, social progress in America. But we'll all appreciate him 20 years from now like we did with Harry Truman. <laughs> you, the other cha another chapter is um, winning women's votes. Mm. Uh, how did the GOP close the gap with uh, women of all races and ethnicities, with people of color? Is it going to happen in the next 10 years, or are we going to have this permanent presidential cycle of seven out, what was it, seven out, eight, six out, seven uh, Democratic presidents? Yeah, well, six, well, five of the last six presidential uh, elections. Uh, uh, Democrats won the majority of the uh, popular vote, exactly. And prior to that, uh, Republicans won five of, of, out of the six previous elections, going back to 68 with Nixon uh, and on up. Yeah, it's a, and a big difference was demographic shifts, because uh, 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 if we, if there were as many, and I, I, you know by now I'm terrible with numbers, that's why I left engineering school, uh, but uh, um, the, uh, if, uh, there were as many white voters, if the percentage of white turnout was as high in, tw uh, in 2012 as it was for Reagan in 1980, then Romney could have won. Uh, but there aren't that many white voters now. Uh, uh, I, I mean, the white population has gone up, but the black, Hispanic, Asian population has gone up faster. Uh, but uh, and as far as women go, there's a gap uh, within women. Uh, married women tend to vote Republican, uh, uh, unmarried women tend to vote uh, Democratic. And I think when you look at the uh, economic differences uh, for unmarried women, you can see uh, what accounts for some of that change, because you've got a lot of single moms out there uh, of all races. Uh, and this is one of the, the, the new invisible poor is the white suburban single mom. <laughs> Uh, we, we don't think about her. We can think about, about the black urban single mom on, on, on welfare. This is kind of a, a, a modern day stereotype. Uh, but there are a lot more white poor than black poor. And uh, uh, this, this has been lost ever since about the LBJ 50 years ago or so. Um, uh, he didn't mean it, but he, but he didn't mean to do it because he started out with Appalachia. But I think uh, we in the media did a lot to uh, colorize poverty in America. I helped along by terrific visuals of. Uh, of uh, urban riots between 65 and 68, which uh, I call one of the greatest affirmative action programs for black journalists ever invented. <laughs> but um, the but the female uh, vote though uh, now not only well, it's interesting because among young college educated women, uh, their uh, income uh, is, is going 
uh, much better than, than it used to be, uh, which we would expect. Uh, and at the same time, though, their social attitudes are going this way, while the Republican um, the Republican Party has gotten more conservative, uh, and thus you get the what they call the war on women, a, a Democratic marketing um, a slogan which has had salience because of uh, some clumsily conservative, I should say, uh, politicians in, in the Republican Party. This year they've been, on P's and Q's, been very, uh, you, you haven't had um, much talk about, uh, uh, what was that uh, uh, Congressman Aiken uh, talking about? Legitimate rape. Legitimate rape. How could I forget? Yes. Legitimate rape versus illegitimate rape, I guess. And uh, you haven't had that kind of clumsy talk in this season, so Republicans have been able to hold their coalition together um, uh, uh, pretty well. And if they keep it up, it could do very well in November. One of them, let's skip around a bit to a different subject. Uh, that's okay. That's what we do in daily journalism. Yeah, that's what you, that's what you suggested. Um, one of the columns that usually used to make me grumpy whenever I read them in the 90s and years was about black conservatives have a good idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I still believe that. I, um, but but my view of conservative, black conservative, may be different than yeah. yours. <laughs> well, I'm not talking about Herman Cain. No, you're not talking about Herman Cain. Nine, nine, nine. <laughs> That's what, that's what his German girlfriend told him. Nine, nine, nine. I gotta be another folks. Yeah. And also, some of the things you say are conservative, I think, are just part of black thought. Self-reliance. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, bring yourself off from the bootstrap. You could hear Malcolm X say that. You could hear... Clarence Thomas' his grandfather. Yeah. Right. All of you. Know, so, but mm -hmm. the... One of the... But one of the people you focus on is... Was, um, who's sort of a very interesting, very thoughtful conservative. What happened to that voice? Because uh, we are in the Kane Keys era now. Not well, you know Bob Woodson? Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Bob Woodson, those of you who don't know, uh, was a, uh, well years ago you could call him a protege of, uh, of uh, Jack Kemp, uh, Congressman Jack Kemp, who was probably the last conservative Republican to have a really strong following among black and Hispanic and poor white folks, and urban that. folks. Yeah, he, he knew how to do it. I mean, he went out number one. I'm sorry? He had a program. He had a program. And he didn't come in, no, no, figure out his program with some think tank over here and come to the ghetto and say, here's what your new program's going to be. No, he went out and talked to people and you know, he, he shut up and listened. That was his whole approach was, you know, you know God, find out what's on their minds. What, 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 what do they want from government? What, what are they trying to get that's not being delivered by Democrats? And then you move in and fill that gap. And uh, he, so he, you had a whole different dialogue going on back in the Kemp days. And I was hoping for great things to happen uh, when uh, Kemp, when Bob Dole picked Jack Kemp to be his running mate in 96. Unfortunately, the Dole campaign told Jack, oh no, we don't worry about those black and Hispanic voters. We're just going to go for the suburbs. That's where the mother load of swing votes is. And both Democrats and Republicans, since the late 80s, since Dukakis, both parties have been pursuing that swing vote uh, that's primarily in the suburbs. And uh, the, the, the inner ring suburbs. Beyond that is Sarah Palin country, I call it. Uh, but um, it, uh, but uh, the, the, the inner ring suburbs. And uh, it was a big disappointment to me and a lot of other people because Kemp was, was muzzled and he and Bob Dole didn't get, didn't get along that well uh, anyway, and, and it showed. Uh, so that campaign was a disaster. Well, we kind of had a little mirror reflection of it with uh, Paul Ryan as uh, Mitt Romney's running mate. Paul Ryan was also a protege of Jack Kemp, and he and, he and Bob Woodson got to know each other quite well in those days. And uh, some of you may have read that you know, uh, Bob Woodson is now kind of, he's viewed as the Stendhali of Paul Ryan uh, for uh, working with uh, grassroots community groups uh, with, uh, to, to develop and, and um, help grassroots programs in, in you know, public housing management, uh, uh, school violence reduction, uh, charter schools, you name it. Uh, Paul Ryan, who admits, comes to admittedly comes from a small Wisconsin town that didn't have a lot of people of color. He's learning uh, people of color. He's been out in lots of uh, neighborhoods across this country. I was just with him uh, recently at a, a gathering of, uh, of a grassroots community leaders in, in Washington and uh, just an informal session around a big table. A lot of these folks already knew Ryan. He'd already been to their communities. And um, now the thing is, Ryan will admit that he 
is not the most articulate in, in, in talking about these problems. Uh, and, and the result is some unfortunate gaps, like when he uh, uh, was talking on, on um, uh, a talk radio show about uh, how the, um, uh, what the, um, uh, I can't remember his exact words, but it, it, it was to the effect he was talking about uh, how inner city uh, black men uh, uh, don't have jobs and uh, don't have a work, work ethic, et cetera, et cetera. He's going on about this. And he was driving at what needs to be done to rebuild jobs and a work ethic in the inner city. They kind of trailed him off, and all you heard was him talking, the bad mouthing poor black folks, and, and this, these sound bites went out. Uh, as they're supposed to when politicians um, uh, speak uh, um, uh, speak you know, in a way that sends uh, the wrong message. Uh, but uh, he's been uh, working on his message now, and uh, I think uh, we could have a beginning of some kind of a new uh, dialogue about how what, what a Republican alternative agenda to what Democrats are offering, a more market-oriented agenda uh, that can um, uh, be something that will compete for the black vote with Democrats. And that's what I, that's what, what I really hope to see, a restoration of that competition, which we used to have. That's why you had um, a Republican President Eisenhower sending the national, sending uh, the uh, 82nd Airborne in uh, to oppose a Democratic governor Faubus. Uh, and um, can America make that change back? I'll tell you quite honestly, uh, Michael, um, I'll probably never live to see it. But I'm still going to push for it anyway. <laughs> I don't think I'd live to see a black president either. No, I don't think most of us did. Right. Yeah. But the last time we had that type of competition was 1950, well, 1960. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nixon got a, uh, didn't get as much as Eisenhower, but he got, he got a substantial. Well, I was it because of goodwill left over from Eisenhower. Yep. And being yeah. the vice president. Yep, that's right. As you point out in another one of your chapters, that's closely connected in some ways with the one of um, conservative ideals as opposed to Republican politicians, is that you don't really care what side of the aisle good policy proposals come from. You're concerned about what works. Right. Things, you think, you think work that we don't pay enough attention to for one reason or another. Well, one thing I've changed my mind on is school choice. Uh, and and uh, vouchers and other types of school choice. Uh, when I first started out, I was completely opposed to it because I thought they just took resources away from public schools. However, I found if you can do it without taking resources from public schools, then it offers uh, working class and, 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 and well, working class and low, other low income, um, black, Hispanic, white parents, what middle class parents already have. What really turned me around was when I found that uh, close to half of Chicago's public school teachers who had, this is back in the 80s, I don't know what the statistics are now, but close to half of the of Chicago public school parents who had, uh, public school teachers who had kids, had their kids in private schools. Yes, it hasn't changed much. Well, this includes two women in my own family, uh, which always makes for interesting Thanksgivings. You know, I, <laughs> I don't even like the Thanksgiving dinners. And so I, well, I don't get out, get it, buy it out much. But uh, the fact is, uh, it's a, um, uh, but the, uh, the, the fact is that uh, we have a bifurcated education system in the country, and I want to see more education opportunity equalized. Uh, so I'm not opposed to charter schools, I'm not opposed to vouchers, I'm not opposed to uh, uh, choice in the public schools. Um, I think it's rather absurd when we have one um, Beverly Hills of public high schools, like Whitney Young, that's so fine that suburban parents are lying to get their kids into it, you know. And then you've got other high school, uh, public high schools where uh, everybody's kind of shakes their head and says, well, it's too bad, you know, and then blah, blah, blah. We, we tolerate too much in this country. We tolerate too much inequality. And so I'm in favor of anything that helps us to reduce inequality. And so I, what, what I'm finding, though, I, I've been, you know, put, ever, ever since the early Reagan era, I've been talking to people like uh, uh, Charles, uh, Murray and various other think tank conservatives, uh, and uh, David Frum, who I uh, uh, really like uh, and, and respect a lot. Uh, and of course, poor David, he got uh, virtually expelled from American Enterprise Institute because he dared to go against the conventional wisdom. Uh, and uh, whereas um, Bob Woodson 
felt he had to leave AEI on his own when Charles Murray came out with uh, the bell curve. Him and Lowry both uh, but, first. I'm sorry? Him and Glenn Lowry both Him and Glenn Lowry, right. Yeah. About the same time, Murray uh, won me back, though, when he, came, when he came out with a book here a few years ago about the, uh, uh, which only looked at white Americans. <laughs> he, you know, he, he learned his lesson, as he can tell you, that you know, he, he only looked at, at white Americans and at inequality. And found they were two different worlds too. Uh, that uh, you got, and the dividing line was a high school diploma. Uh, if you have a high school diploma or less, your chances for upward mobility in today's economy are greatly, dramatically reduced, or almost non-existent, uh, for for real upward mobility. Uh, and um, uh, for those who have more than a high school education, uh, you've got opportunity. You've got a, a, a chance, and, and, and statistical advancement. And uh, I've been on stage with Charles Murray uh, debating him uh, uh, two or three times uh, since then. Uh, and, um, it, uh, and, and I've said as much to the public, I said, thank you, Charles, for just looking at white folks. It gets you, you know, stick with your specialty and it gives, it gives, you, it gives you out of trouble. Because if you're only looking at whites, then nobody can call you racist. Nobody can, 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 can impose their own uh, uh, racial tableau on the whole thing. Uh, it becomes now just a look at economic inequality in itself. So I, I think what I'm finding is, though, um, again, that's what David Trump from. Uh, I will get a conservative thinker who comes up with some ideas that are really useful that I think would have some appeal to the black community, and they lose their appeal with their own right-wing base in the Republican Party, like the Tea Party folks, full of Schlafly and the rest. They see absolutely no need for outreach, none. You know, uh, Phyllis Lafley and uh, Pat Buchanan, uh, they say all the parties got to do is just, just knock on more doors and uh, you know, ring more doorbells and uh, make more phone calls and roust out the conservative base. That's all you need. And now I believe in the politics of, of addition, that you go out and you form coalitions with like-minded people. And I think the Republican Party doesn't do that. Uh, eventually the numbers are obviously catching up with them. One of the... You said you just talked about different worlds. In one of your columns, you said the Kerner Commission, this was several years after the Kerner Commission, you said the Kerner, Kerner Commission was half right. How would we look at the Kerner Commission today? What would the Kerner, the Kerner Commission report let's say today about inequality in America? Now, I went back and looked at that, in fact, because I know 50 years, it's been up, uh, almost 50 years, certainly. Uh, this coming year will be the 50th anniversary of the Watts riots. But it, it was the New York Harlem riots in 64, really, that started that wave of riots in the uh, late 60s. Uh, but um, the uh, uh, current commission talked about how we were two Americans, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Uh, they were optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> we are more than two Americas, and we are more than black and white, obviously. We have a, a, a number of colors, and, and obviously the way economics play out, uh, like Skip Gates pointed out in his PBS special back in the late 80s, that uh, the divide between uh, black haves and have-nots is wider than the divide between blacks and whites. Essentially, uh, uh, if, if you look at the um, uh, income numbers and the uh, upward mobility numbers and all, so we obviously have a class problem, but oh, Americans are so nervous about class. I mean, we're nervous talking about race. We'd rather talk about sex than race. I mean, who wouldn't? Uh, but uh, talking about class, forget it. But I've always said, you know, no, race, race talk is like, like sex talk. Everybody feels expert at it. Uh, and, uh, and yet we don't want to discuss it in front of the children or in a mixed company. And class is the same way. People you bring up class at, at a proper Hyde Park party, and people will put down their drinks and head for the door. You know, it's rather uh, remarkable. Well, some Hyde Park parties. Yeah, the others people will never leave, but they just keep them all, all night long talking about it. <laughs> but I would, I want to talk a little bit trash about one of my former colleagues, Mr. Gates. Oh, He's yeah. worse in numbers than you are. <laughs> um, what, what do you think of that? Well, I, I, maybe I'll pull you tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, I do think that we're more than two nations, and I think that race and class are. And, and we have to, and when you look at the number, gender all intersect with each other. That, you know, I mean, can we crunch all many other bell hooks? I've written about this for a few decades now. What I think is slightly uh, deceptive, not intentionally, uh, but misleading is a better word, about uh, Skip's claim is that the uh, proportions are different among blacks and whites, but when you look at the interracial differences between blacks and whites, uh, whites and Latinos, there are still 
much more masculine when we think about broad economics. We think about wealth differences, income ratios, unemployment statistics, statistics that be the big gap between uh, among blacks. So my, my first book is about class divisions among African Americans and the political consequences. Um, that is going to be part of how I think about the world. But I, I think Americans are, particularly in this era, you, talk, you allude to this when you talk about the president's move to try to substitute economic um, criteria for racial criteria. Right. We can't, we can't do, we have to do all of that. We have to look at gender differences, we have to look at class, and we have to look at race, but we don't want to look at, as you say, Americans don't even talk about sex that much. I've been spending a lot of time in Europe and other places. Yep. Americans don't like to talk about any of it. Right. Uh, and particularly when it comes to subjects where their privilege might be somewhat stepped on, or their people are asking. We have forgotten, I think, remember what you think, have Americans forgotten how to make sacrifices for other members of their community? Yeah, I think they have, and I, I've been intrigued by um, uh, what I call comedy re uh, research for um, the, uh, um, uh, well, I do some, some writing about uh, the, um, um, what's it called, the, uh, the, the certain, well, birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> uh, the idea of, uh, uh, not, not just comedy, but, uh, um, the uh, uh, homophily, that's the word I'm looking for, homophily. Uh, uh, birds of a feather flock together, the, the, the human tendency, and not just among humans, uh, to uh, be with one's own kind. And it's the foundation of family, of tribe, and civilization was really developed in order to get us past tribal thinking, to be able to get people from different tribes uh, to be able to work together uh, and uh, cooperate. And I think this is what, this is a challenge that we Americans are, facing in a different kind of way. I mean, what we, well, I say we um, uh, collectively, because uh, Americans dealt with diversity in their founding days. Just, just read your, your the Tocqueville, he talks about uh, the uh, uh, blacks, the whites, the Native Americans of that time, uh, and, and marvel at how well they cooperated, in fact. Uh, but there's a, uh, we, we are constantly facing uh, these kinds of challenges. And um, I think it's coming at, at us once again here in, in this era. Yeah. Uh, but um, when we talk about uh, the, 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 uh, the divisions, we are, well, there's still a tendency on the part of some folks to want to divide us by race so that we don't come together around issues of class. And that was very important in the days of John C. Calhoun, for that matter. And one of the things that fascinates me about the early Republican Party, uh, was uh, the um, uh, was the, the, the populist element uh, that um, got the free soil farmers uh, who were hardly civil rights leaders. They were independent farmers who didn't like the plantations because they were was taking away their business and resources and, and competing with them. Uh, slave labor was undermining white labor. Very, very smart grassroots economic theory. And uh, Lincoln was, was a Whig with that same agenda. And they pulled together uh, with the uh, northern business people like Joe Medill from the Chicago Tribune. And this back then was the Tribune and American or something like that. It was longer name them. Everything was longer. They had more time to read back then. Uh, and uh, it was a, uh, you, you had this kind of coalition forming from very different interests, but they had a, a common interest that pulled them together. And uh, whenever those kind of interests try to pull together today, there will always be other interests that will try to pull them apart. And, uh, uh, but, but when I talk about, about homophily, um, there have been studies, comparative studies, looking at uh, why is there so little resistance to national health care in Scand Scandinavia compared to here over a modest reform like Obamacare. Uh, and yet uh, you would think it's socialism, it's communism, it's Marxism, blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, it's not. Or stealth reparations, as you point out. Oh, stealth reparations, yeah, that, that's the line that, that uh, Rush Limbaugh gave on the air and got picked up by a, a number of other people that just really stealth reparations. In other words, the black guys trying to take your money and give it to the black folks and this kind of thing. You know, uh, it, it's code, uh, racial code that we're very accustomed to in, uh, in politics over the years. But now it's blasted out 24-7 in modern media. And I think we're only beginning to examine 
uh, the impact of, of modern media on modern politics. If we have a time for a couple more of my questions before we open up to the audience. But I can interview you? Uh, you can ask whatever you want. <laughs> um, you reflect in one of your columns that you wrote during the year that you, before you went to the publisher about what would Dr. King say about the time in 1988? What, what would he say? What would Dr. King say about the American Union 5 in 2014? Uh, well, you know, I also wrote a column, I wrote the same one, but uh, I wrote a column about um, why do people keep talking about what Dr. King would say? They don't know. We don't know. <laughs> you know uh, but yeah, we, we, we can't do that. You know, what I do is uh, I always wonder what Frederick Douglass would say. You know, I, uh, I'm fascinated by, by, by Douglass in the period that, that he lived in. He was a man up from slavery who was a progressive Republican. Uh, in fact, he, he pushed Lincoln to. Uh, to a satisfying Emancipation Proclamation and other things, and effectively uh, got uh, so much out of uh, the uh, political establishment at that time. But um, uh, what would uh, Douglas or King say now? Uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, Tavis Smiley has one idea, and I've got some others. I think um, uh, Tavis uh, felt that King would have would have continued on the uh, the uh, socialist, what, what social democrat. Party. I mean, if he was in Scandinavia, you'd call him a social democrat because uh, uh, it, would, it would be more centralized uh, ownership and, and more uh, um, uh, equal uh, what, equalization of uh, benefits. You can see it right in his I Have a Dream speech where he talks about the promissory note and uh, uh, came back marked um, uh, insufficient funds. He wants to fulfill, fulfill that promissory note, which means some kind of reparations. Uh, and, um, I think um, that uh, there, there would, but I think King would be especially upset with the class divide in the black community now. Uh, you saw how he accomplished so much helping to push and promote the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and, and the, House, the Fair Housing Act. Uh, and, but um, there you saw, you know, when he went from racial issues to economic issues, that was when he began to lose a lot of Northern liberals. And a lot of no, he lost some of his own people. He lost some of his own people, exactly. You don't call out names, but... No, no, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. And in fact, you know, I, I, I credit Tavis for his new book looking at the last days of King, because we don't talk enough about that, and about the divide in the movement, and um, the movements are very diverse, just like African Americans are very diverse. Uh, it's a, uh, well, when I think about King, I think about how there was a national consensus in favor of civil rights and, and, and voting rights. It's very fundamentally American. I mean, uh, how could, uh, Barry Goldwater, it's, it, it's a cipher why he crossed over, because he was an NAACP member. He was, uh, his, his wife was the head of, uh, of the Planned Parenthood board out there in Phoenix. Uh, he, he, he desegregated his own department stores out there before anybody else did. And yet, uh, uh, this time he caved in to trying to pander to the Southern um, uh, Southern uh, segregationist Democrats, which we saw happen with um, a, a wing of the Republican Party back in the late 1800s, which again, kind of I'm getting back to that black history, but or, or, or Republican history. But uh, um, the, the, the main thing was that um, uh, what struck me was once King had achieved those victories on the racial front, civil rights front, uh, and, and I got to include women, because women are important part of the Civil Rights Act as well. <laughs> Uh, that uh, we found the coalition began to break apart, uh, began to fragment, and uh, uh, it reminded me of that old Southern story my father told me about the uh, preacher who preached the Ten Commandments on a Sunday morning, and uh, uh, he said, "Thou shalt not kill." And uh, Deacon in the front row said, "Amen, Reverend." Amen. He said, "Thou shalt not steal." Deacon shouts even louder, "Amen, Reverend." Preach on, preach on. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Deacon gets up and walks out. <laughs> and he gets to the door, he turns and he says, now you didn't stop preaching and going to meddling. <laughs> I mean, that's what Dr. King. King moved from race to class. <laughs> but, well, now you didn't stop preaching and going to meddling. You saw what happened when he, when he gave his anti-Vietnam speech. Yeah, there's the, the, the war and right. class, you know, we're, you know, dying at the 
time that he was working for the janitors. Right. He lost people like Andy Young, he lost a number That's of people. Right. Dr. Man, LBJ was furious on oh, the yeah. anti war speech. You know, how can you do this? That meant the back of so the New York Times and yeah, right. some other right. from the country. Exactly. And uh, Mayor Daley was very supportive of civil rights so long as it was down in Birmingham. And all of us. Not in Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> all of Chicago, exactly. When King came here, well, we don't need the Dr. King to come here. Uh, we've got our own black ministers right here in town, our own colored ministers right here in town. And all they did, uh, he had a whole line of, yep. of black ministers right here in Chicago. And said, we don't need you, Dr. King. Thank you, you can go right on back down. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's quite remarkable. So, you know, these, these things will repeat themselves over and over again. Um, I feel like, you know, it's kind of a dialectic of, of, of um, progress, though, that they don't take two steps forward and one step back. Uh, either way, we sell newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the quotes in your book is from Thurgood Marshall. And yeah. some reporter screamed at him, what's your legacy? And he says, before, I guess he looked sort of evil, but he said, he wanted to do what he could with what he had. Yeah, it was a, um, well, it was his last news conference, and I had just arrived in Washington, and I was all excited and bedazzled as uh, any, I felt like a, lot, like a kid again showing up in Chicago as a cub reporter with, with visions of Ben Head and Charles McCarthy in my head and all, and Chicago Defender and the great days of the abolitionist press, et cetera, et cetera. I, I get to Washington now, I get the big time, you know. And the uh, report comes, you know, the day schedule comes in. Thurgood Marshall's had a news conference uh, over, over in Capitol Hill. Everybody knew his health was failing. Everybody knew that Clarence Thomas was on the horizon as the leading contender to fill uh, his seat. And uh, I just jumped in a cab and went over there because I'm a columnist now, a big time columnist. I can just go over to the Supreme Court and say, uh, I'm a big time columnist. I'm here to be a news conference. <laughs> and I did. And I thought like a good thing I, I did just to help to balance off the age because everybody sent their young reporters, their young whippersnappers from Dar Dartmouth and, uh, and, and Vassar and all uh, over there to this news conference. And um, we had no historical perspective, uh, which is what you call, um, uh, what Benjamin Israeli would say, I'm in my anecdotage. Uh, uh, the time when I'm, uh, I've got lots of stories to tell, this kind of thing. And, 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 and that's where Thurgood Marshall was. But these kids weren't ready to bring that out of, of him. They just wanted to know one question. What do you think of Clarence Thomas? And so they all asked him that same question, rephrased 15 different ways. The best answer he gave, and he was um, uh, very, uh, like I said, uh, he was frail but still feisty. And uh, I mean, the first thing that he said, as he sat down with great effort, you know, you know, how do you feel, Mr. Justice? And he said, how do I feel? I'm old and falling apart. <laughs> that was a quote. And then, um, but when he asked about Thomas, he, he, he sounded like a Delphic oracle. He, he said, old man said there ain't no difference between a white snake and a black snake. They both bite. <laughs> that was it. That was his answer. <laughs> that was his answer. I'm sitting in the back door. <laughs> Hey, thank you, Jay-Z. <laughs> and uh, but these, but they, they still ask him these questions. Finally, they, they run out of energy, you know, and, and, and so there's a, there's a law. And I said, Mr. Justice, how do you want to be remembered? And he, he said, he sort of looked up at me. I uh, saw, saw me there in the crowd. And he just said, he did the best he could with what he had. And that became the headline in Time Magazine the next week. Where it across two pages. I said, no, no, this, this, this really, it's still, I'm, I'm, I'm overcome with emotion. I think about the life of this man, what, what he did back in the 40s, even before you No know, Brown v. Board. He was, he was, you know, he was a legal defense fund lawyer. He was out there going from town to town, saving black men and women from getting lynched. Sometimes he got to town too late. Sometimes he almost got lynched himself. But, but he persevered, and he became you know, the, the leading, uh, uh, the, the lead arguer in favor of what became the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And he later became the first black uh, justice of the Supreme Court. And I've all that history, you know, that comes down to, to the best he could with what he had. And I said, well, what more can any of us ask in life? On that note, let's open it up for questions from the audience. That's the Please come to the microphone if you have a question. Uh, great 
great to be here. Um, love you on McLaughlin Group. I'm glad somebody does. I uh, wish you were on more, but can you tell no, John, us? No, that's why email was invented. <laughs> can you tell us anything behind the scenes? Uh, is it rehearsed? Uh, is it heavily edited? And do you all go out for a drink afterwards? I'm delighted to hear there's still some mystique behind the you know, out there about the McLaughlin group. I used to get those questions a lot more than I do now, partly because there's so many imitators, you know? Yeah. Uh, in fact, you've got a whole cable channel that try to be nothing but, you know, well, let's shout at each other for a while, you know? But uh, there's a certain magic to McLaughlin. Uh, first of all, no, it is not rehearsed. Uh, I get the question all the time. Um, doesn't have to be, because you have to understand, those of you who never lived in Washington before, uh, you know, you've got to understand the culture of the place, that it's just a part of your daily life that's going on in government. And so everybody's talking stuff all the time. Kind of like here in Hyde Park, for that matter. But, <laughs> but it's like, uh, I mean, I Roger Simon, who grew up uh, here at South Shore, uh, we're both about the same age, and he, uh, he's a, he was the columnist for the Sun-Times and the Tribune now for Politico in Washington. He got to Washington. He said Washington is like one big college town. You know, you've got the the um, uh, well, you've got uh, official Washington and you've got the district. You know, official Washington is on the uh, is on the uh, uh, network news, and the district is on local news. And you've got uh, town versus gown, and everybody cares about what's going on at the president's house, right? And it's like there's that kind of a provincialism about a very cosmopolitan city. It's amazing, but, but no, you don't have to rehearse it because we, uh, we all know what's, what's the buzz is each week. In fact, you know, sometimes John will say, who won the week? You know, cause that's, a, that's a big question in Washington. Who won the week? You know, did Obama win this week or did Bader win this week? You know, Obama's been losing a lot of weeks lately. Here. <laughs> he's got to he's got, he got, 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 got buff things up a bit, but uh, this, is, this is just kind of a culture, so that, that's reflected in the show. And as far as uh, the um, uh, question about the, um, uh, well, the... Um, um, it might be edited. Yeah, yeah the editing. All right. Uh, I'm surprised how little editing there was. Before I went down there, uh, I thought that this was all uh, kind of like putting together a, uh, a, a hip-hop album. It, go, uh, the, the, it goes into the uh, editing room and it comes out with a piece of magic, uh, very different from what it was before. But no, actually, um, the, uh, there's very little editing uh, that's done, except when, when John goofs up. Um, I mean, well, the rest of us goofs, it goes right up on, on the air. But if he goofs, uh, uh, or uh, if uh, uh, the rest of us flash is brilliant. So I, I remember back in 2000, uh, we were doing, going into the predictions, and um, uh, Don was running out of time, so he just said, uh, what's the makeup of the next Senate going to be? Because we've got a situation like now where we could tilt either way. And it came around to me, and I said, 50 50. And you know what? It was 50 50. <laughs> you remember that? You know? Do you think John, the, the following week after the election, said, Well, we have a winner here on the show who got it right on the nose? No. <laughs> if it wasn't for me, you would never know about this, right? <laughs> right and say, uh, but uh, yeah, if, if, uh, but if, if John's prediction is right, you're going to hear about it. <laughs> but thank you, and keep watching. Hi. Uh, I want to ask you about school choice. Yes. I've been involved with Chicago Public Schools since Arnie Duncan was doing his Renaissance 2010 initiative, right. kind of the petri dish of school choice. And I'm just, I've also worked at some alternative schools. I actually work at a new type of iteration of choice, which is this option school, which is a for-profit organization. Um, I'm not terribly pleased. I see the difference between Lane Tech and Whitney Young and some of the other schools. And I'm just, I see these charter schools pushing out a lot of the kids who can't make it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of interested in why you support this idea of kind of building these alternatives as opposed to addressing the core issues of the public schools and maybe even collaborating some of these better schools with the ideas of for CPS. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very attracted to shaking things up because things have been working so poorly for so long that uh, I'm in favor of, uh, of uh, like a thousand flowers bloom, number one. Number two, I'm a parent, uh, which means that, uh, number one, I'm an expert, of course, on child rearing. Because every parent is. They just ask us, right? Uh, number one. Number two, uh, the humble parent uh, learns from their kids uh, things like uh, every child learns differently. They really do. 
and there ain't no way to predict 100%. You know, the way a kid's gonna go, but you you uh, uh, you reproduce and take your chances. I've, I've even seen <laughs> identical twins who can have personalities entirely different, and learning. I won't say learning ability, but just uh, an interest in learning that's entirely different. And our son is just a perpetual wonder to behold uh, because um, he's, uh, I thought it was just him, I thought there was a lot of kids like him. He loves to read, uh, but not for class. And uh, if you want to get him uh, not to touch something, just say it's part of a classroom assignment. Uh, number two, he will complete an assignment, but not turn it in because he, got his satisfaction out of it. Said, but you do your job, you want to get paid. And he said, oh, Dad, how crass. <laughs> That's so last century. He's also, uh, he's, he's also a would-be rock star. And I, uh, as I tell him, well, you want to get paid for your records or, or whatever you all record in the future. And he said, money for music? Oh, how Philistine, what a Philistine. What's the matter with you? <laughs> I mean, he's a whole different frame of reference. Uh, but um, uh, so he'll be motivated differently, and uh, I, I have found that this is why women are taking over the planet now. That not, now that we let you have some rights, you just taking taking advantage of it right and left. And uh, uh, you know, since the early '90s, uh, girls have been outpacing boys on on, on uh, uh, like entry college entry, and um, uh, the guys now. I don't know what to say about these fellas. Uh, uh, like like my son, but they're like mosquitoes in a nudist colony. They've got too many choices. And then, you know, and they all learn differently. If it weren't for, I was telling young people earlier about the high school teacher who turned me on to journalism, and we had a good student, a really good high school newspaper. And after that, I don't know where I'd be, you know, bounce around out there. Why do I say all this? Because anytime somebody tells you they've got a one size fits all solution for education, they're lying, or they're just plain old naive. Uh, I've done several documentaries and uh, uh, stories about uh, stu students in uh, choice programs in Milwaukee, Cleveland, and other cities, and Chicago. And I'm not 100% uh, for vouchers. I don't, know, I don't think vouchers are the 100% solution. But I've seen vouchers make a big difference for a lot of kids and their families to uh, get, get some choices. I've seen in Washington, D.C., where they have a, a, a privatized voucher a program. Uh, Parents every year lining up. Uh, well, well you, everybody here now has seen uh, a Superman movie. There, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, how hard parents will sacrifice to get their kids into the choice schools and this sort of thing. So it's obvious that there is a demand out there. I want to improve the supply. Uh, I want to, uh, to to get more choices out there uh, for people. And yeah, you know, what, what about the charter school that, that kicks out the kids who are either troublesome <coughs> or they're ADD like I, I know I am and uh, or, or uh, uh, various other problems. Well, I'm less concerned about their being kicked out of the school than why isn't there some other school to take them in? Why isn't there a place that is more ready to deal with kids who've got special needs like that? Uh, this is what we're really striving for in our society, I think. So, so well, uh, well, what do you think? I well, well, yeah, well, I would say one of the issues, I think, is all the obsession with testing. Because a lot of these kids can't do well on tests, and there's such a push, I can even say, from the school I'm working at, to get these numbers and there's such a disconnect between the tests and the actual behavior and success. Yeah. So I yeah. think that that's really... Did you ever watch The Wire? Oh yeah. HBO, you know, they had put the third season all about school. Every season, yeah. But, but every season on The Wire had a subtext to it and I, was, I wondered what it was when David Simon testifying before Congress uh, uh, said it was numbers. Yeah. That my modern life, uh, the eighth season, whether it, it was crime, public housing, Jobs, schools, or journalism. Those were the five seasons. And it was all numbers. And you know, journalism, do more with less. <laughs> and you got the Baltimore Sun was depicted there. And who, who was the owners of those sun? Chicago Tribune Company out here in Chicago. Well, the schools were in that same kind of situation. You know, they're being told, do more with less and give us some numbers. Then, then we'll know the kids are learning. Well, they, they go to numbers because they have nothing else. You know, and, and we need some better metrics. That was, that was an old Donald Rumsfeld term. Metrics. But uh, we're looking for the right kind of metric for education. We have just a few minutes left, so could you state your question? Both of you state your question. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try to be brief. That'll be something better. <laughs> well, I, I, I wanted to bring you to the politics of journalism and newspapers. Uh, 
Recently, we've had. I'm not going to explain the Bruce Rauner endorsement. Yours. So go ahead. Want to ask about it? Go ahead. Actually, I was going to start with the Chicago Sun Times. Yeah. Which, of course, Mr. Rauner had been an, an investor in the group that owns the uh, the publication now. Yeah. And coincidentally, they changed their policy of not endorsing because this was such an important endorsement to make. Yeah, they also, it saves money. They also, you may know the reporter, Dave McKinney, an outstanding reporter in Springfield for the Sun-Times, who was suspended for five days because he wrote a critical article about the Rauner campaign. And now, to come to you, you sit on the editorial board of the Chicago Tribune. It's, a, it's very difficult to see that you've won many battles in that uh, context. And so why do you stay on the editorial board and give them some kind of sense that they have representation? Well, when you win some, you lose some. <laughs> uh, no, I've, uh, uh, I mean, I've had moments where I, where I well, for example, I, when um, I did the uh, civil rights organizer of the 64 March, uh, who was all, Mayor Rustin, yes, uh, Mayor Rustin, uh, who had been denounced by the old Tribune editorial board, the old last century editorial board, which also denounced the Civil Rights Act of 64 and 65. Uh, you know, that was a different era. Uh, and it, it was uh, my personal honor after he died to write the Tribune editorial uh, about uh, uh, Baird Rustin. And um, a roll back, I felt kind of like, you know, uh, Thurgood Marshall, that, uh, well, Thurgood Marshall sitting on, on, on the Rehnquist court. You know, uh, you win some battles, you lose some, but you always uh, try to have some kind of an impact. Uh, and uh, that's the way it's been. I, uh, the funny thing is, uh, uh, the, uh, when, when I first came on the uh, intro report back in 84, uh, it, it was like, well, I did feel like Thurgood Marshall on the Rehnquist Court. Now, there's so many members who are more liberal than I am, that I feel like the old fogey. Probably because I am the old fogey. Uh, we need old fogies out there, too. Uh, to, uh, for some kind of consistency, as it were. But uh, I'm delighted, first of all, that you read the editorials uh, and pay attention to them, uh, because the, uh, it's, it's a lot of work to put them together. Uh, the, the Sun Times isn't the only paper that stopped doing endorsements, because it's a lot of work. And uh, uh, you get, um, you don't get a lot of praise except by those people whom you endorse, <laughs> and, and the, the ones that agree with you. Uh, but uh, the thing about the endorsements is, uh, the ones for president and governor have the least impact because you know once the top of the ticket those are the ones everybody thinks of first and everybody's pretty much made up their minds already before they read your editorial it's the ones now at the bottom you know you get those long lists of judges you know we're still electing judges in this county you know uh, it's, like, it's like but, but you get the long list of judges nobody knows who these people are except three quarters of them have irish names um, and half of them changed their names so they would be Irish. <laughs> because uh, some of you remember back in the 70s, the, Chicago, the old Chicago Daily News did an investigation, statistical investigation, and found that if you had an Irish surname or middle name, uh, your chances of getting elected on the judicial ballot were uh, like five times greater, something like that. So a lot of people changed their names. Uh, like, uh, uh, a number of women candidates went back to their maiden names and this sort of thing. You know? uh, and, uh, so th th that's where it makes a difference, though, down uh, at, at, at the bottom of the ticket. So I'm much more concerned about that. But the ones, the names at the top of the ticket, of course, get talked about more. Uh, and um, uh, that's, uh, frankly, uh, whether I agree with the endorsement uh, or not, uh, it's interesting uh, the kind of arguments that are made. And if you want to make, make a, a good argument, uh, Rauner uh, seems like the, the the best arguments being made for Rauner is that he's not Quinn. Uh, and that, um, therefore, um, whether he's qualified or not, whether they like his ideas or not, he'll shake things up. And, uh, but people get really frustrated and they want to see things shaken up. Uh, so uh, that's kind of uh, what, what has happened here. And uh, let's wait and see what happens in 2016. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hello. Um, this is a question about culture. So what do you think black culture is in America? Oh, boy. Good question. Have you heard of a movie called uh, um, uh, Dear White People? Yeah, I've never seen it. Have you seen it yet? Uh, no, it's coming out soon. It came out this week, and my wife and I went right out to see it, and I recommend that everybody ought to go see it. it. It's a boot, first of all. It is, if you like if you like Spike Lee's School Days, you'll love this. It's really kind of, kind of what it is. It's like Spike Lee's School Days 20-some-odd years later. Uh, it's, it's, it's more of a millennial 
generation created this, and it's a, it's a, it's very smart. It's right on time, and uh, it the essential uh, issues are among other things is, is what is black culture, and uh, what is uh, uh, the, the direction for African Americans as well as other people of color, and it's all on, on this college campus, uh, and um, you, you've got the um, uh, white kids too, and the question is that, that they're raising too. You know, you got the, 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 this one. Uh, snooty uh, fraternity president. Uh, every camp, every campus needs one. Uh, who um, he, he's a snooty white uh, fraternity president who who believes that uh, black people have it better off than white people nowadays. And that uh, in, in the age of Colin Powell and uh, Oprah Winfrey, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, uh, the, the uh, a white man is the most discriminated uh, person in America. And uh, yeah, it sounds laughable, but there's a, a substantial number of Tea Party voters feel that way. <laughs> and, and a few poll, a very good polls show it. Yeah, majority of white Americans. Well, as far as white, well, Tea Party Republicans, those who call themselves self conservative Republicans, a majority do believe that. <laughs> that uh, we'll talk further than that. We can talk yeah, we talk about that. that. <laughs> there's a lot of numbers. But, uh, <laughs> it's all we've got. <laughs> we try to be precise in these things. Uh, please say some more though. Tell, tell me about what you think black culture is. Do you think that it's it's becoming a good thing, black culture, or do you think that um, it's it's negative and it's not really really our culture because it's something that was forced upon us when we came to America? Well, you know that's uh, why I thought about uh, this movie because. Uh, those questions are raised. There's, um, and in the same way they were raised on my campus in the 60s. And I, I was a campus journalist in the 60s, uh, partly because it gave me the freedom to be in the middle of all these cl culture clashes and say, you know, hey, I'm being objective, you know. And it, it almost worked, but I finally got nailed as Uncle Tom about a month before graduation. So, so I, I did pretty good. Uh, that, that happens in this movie too. There's, there's a, a black kid who's a newspaper journalist uh, and uh, actually with a satirical magazine, but nevertheless, uh, he gets caught uh, between that. And uh, it's like uh, there's uh, some who are fraternity sorority people, there are some who are hip hoppers, there are some who are modern day Panthers. Uh, and this is so much like the uh, school was back, uh, in, back in my day. Uh, so you can't just talk about one black culture. There's a lot of them. Uh, we talk about a black community, though, because a community, to me, is, is a group of people who share the same values, who share similar experiences, and, and uh, uh, may share the same backgrounds or similar backgrounds. Uh, this is why uh, you see a different kind of culture among African immigrant families as opposed to African American families, those who are descended from slavery, for example. Uh, we're, we're just beginning to explore that. And once again, it's the American way that those families are intermarrying with each other. And will or not, they produce the next generation of TV sitcoms. <laughs> <laughs> On that extremely cheerful note, <laughs> I've been instructed to close this down. I want to say the sponsor of this event, the Office of Civic Engagement at UChicago Engage, Diversity Leadership Council, Chicago Tribune, Agate Publishing, and the CSRPC. And once again, let's thank Mr. Clarence Page for a wonderful evening.